there. I am having the best day because I am here with the absolutely lovely Margaret Wrinkle. She is the author of just beautiful things like the book Late Migrations and her newest book, The Comfort of Crows. It is, well, I'll let her explain. But we're here in Nashville and uh, she's already my favorite. And I kind of wish we were doing this outside since your great glory is in noticing the world as it is. Margaret, I'm so glad we're doing this. I cannot believe you came all the way to Nashville so we could walk around looking at ass sparrows. But thank you. I'm so <laughs> delighted to be here. Operation Friendship is a go. <laughs> <laughs> so you call yourself a backyard naturalist. I wondered if you could tell me what that means to you. The thing I love about the word naturalist, yeah. which is very different from the word scientist, because a scientist has a specialty, uh -huh. so you can be an entomologist, or you can be, um, you could be an ornithologist, or you could you have a specialty, you know, down to the tiniest little yeah. fungus <laughs> growing beneath the soil. But um, a naturalist is, a, you know, you, you re it requires no credentials really. You just call yourself that. And it can mean, a, you know, it really, there are credentialing organizations you can be. In fact, in Tennessee, um, a certified Tennessee naturalist. Yeah. I'm not one. Um, but I think it just means that you notice and study and learn from the natural world mm. and the learning part is my favorite yeah like I begin from a position of ignorance in almost every single thing I do so um, it doesn't take much for me to learn because yeah. I don't know anything at all oh wow what is this bug yeah. or wait that's what you know, like that sound I'm hearing is a Carolina wren. Like I know Carolina wrens really well, but I didn't know that song from the treetops came yeah. from a Carolina wren. Yeah. When did you first start getting wonderfully, partially obsessively curious? Because I find curiosity requires like the like, and then what? <laughs> Impulse. That most I, would, I think I was themselves. born that way. Yeah. I, th I think part of being my age, I'll, I'll be 62 this fall and growing up where I grew up in in lower Alabama I think a lot of it is just kids aren't allowed to be bored much anymore mm -hmm. and they also are highly supervised and so but my mother was like go play yeah. you know come back when you're hungry but by the time I was back in college in a rural college Auburn University it was just a five-minute walk to be outside campus in a field mm. or in a forest and that was a great comfort to me whenever school was too stressful yeah so it's always been that way I think there was like a homecoming feeling it sounds like it really when you grow up like that to be in the woods or the fields or beside a creek it it because I think we take comfort from what gave us comfort when we were younger. Yeah. So going back f does feel like coming home. And, and the older I get now that my children are grown, especially, I feel myself becoming more and more what I most essentially am mm. and less my role in other people's lives. And that is who I most essentially am, I think. Is a noticer, is a... Mm -hmm. But I don't notice certain things, like I didn't know where to turn to get to the elevator when we were out here. <laughs> yeah, you really You didn't. know, it's a, it's a pretty specific <laughs> kind of noticing, but yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Left and right, not my forte. Well, no problem with the orienteering. <laughs> I did actually not get that badge either when I was in Girl, <laughs> in Girl Scouts. <laughs> That's so funny. I, I guess like the, because I, I moved from the middle of Canada to wherever I went to school. And I think it was at that point that I stopped noticing really anything in the natural world because I didn't recognize it. And if I didn't recognize it, I just couldn't. I don't know, like I still am constantly getting poison ivy because I have no idea what poison ivy in North Carolina looks like. That's so funny. I I think all the time. I had this, there was an article in the New York Times last week, I think, um, about climate mm -hmm. um, 
refugees. And, and they didn't mean people leaving Indonesia because their islands were going to be underwater. Yeah. They meant people leaving lower Alabama because there was there it, crops won't grow I mean yeah. in the future and I and and they had some suggestions for places in this country where climate migrants could go and one of them was was um Detroit because there's a plant it's it's gonna it's gonna be cooler uh-huh. and a longer growing season in time and there's plenty of housing and I said to my husband this is the perfect time we could you're getting ready to retire I can work from anywhere our daughter-in-law is a nurse she could work from anywhere yeah. our son's an engineer his his colleagues already live anywhere I mean we could just we could just this was a good time to go and then I thought well first of all he poo-pooed the whole idea like we're not moving to Detroit and taking everybody with us that they won't do that but then part of me was like but I don't know any of those birds yeah. I do know some of them because they come and spend the winter here but it would be very disorienting yeah, yeah. not to know the flowers not yeah not to know the names of trees it's like the smell for me it's always the smell of chamomile right after a rain and uh and the number of drowning worms that like always need my attention that used to take when i was little i mean that was like that could be my full-time job i could just go around (laughs) rescuing saving unwilling worms but there was a feeling that and i still feel like i feel at peace in a different way when I'm in Winnipeg, Manitoba than I am. Well, okay. Two questions on that. One is, and I I don't mean it as facetiously as it sounds. How do we feel at home? How do, how does becoming more aware of your surroundings, um, reconnect you with an earth that's sometimes trying to murder you? Like I was bitten by a poisonous copperhead, um, snake a couple I don't know last year as part of my attempt to reconnect to nature and then I'm very sorry they can be very touchy I had to be (laughs) envenomated for some time but there's the feeling like is the more at home we are we're not entirely um it's it's not just like the well maybe it is the scene of Bambi it's hard to say I think that's the thing that I struggle with always Mm. How do you love a world that is so violent? And it's not just it's not just the venomous snakes. Um, it's also the way they're all out there just killing and eating each other. There are very few true vegetarians in the natural world. And even the vegetarians are eating a plant that would prefer not to be eaten. Yeah. So it's... It's just part of how it yeah. works, and that is a challenge, and it will always be a challenge. Yeah. How do you, how do you love something that exists in a state of constant violence? Yeah. Because even the bluebirds that are being hunted by the Cooper's hawk, they're out there hunting the grasshoppers. And we think, oh, the bluebirds are cute, so we're rooting for the bluebird, and not necessarily the hawk. And we are giving no thought at all to the yeah. cricket in the grass. It's hard, but it, I think that's part of loving something, isn't it? it, it, it no matter who, who it is or what it is, it comes with a downside. Mm-hmm. And you elect to love it anyway. Mm-hmm. It's an act of attention and an act, an act of concentration. And it's a decision, always. You kind of made this decision to love your surroundings in this book in a really, really concrete way, which to me reads so devotionally, like, because it's, it's structured by the weeks and the seasons. So people, someone could pick it up and be like, ah, it is, you know, partway through spring. What am I noticing? And you like walk us through a year of noticing. I, I'm so happy that you said the word devotional because I used to, um, I used to describe it when I was working on it as a pagan devotional. <laughs> and my editor was going, you have to stop saying that. <laughs> I know what you mean, though. Like, pagan in the sense of, like, this is this is the de- one of the deep stories of who we are is just the story of our spiritual attention to the earth. That's right. It's from which we came. Uh-huh. Paying, like, I want, I really thought I might do it as an actual devotional. Uh-huh. One day at a time. But it, it, But I wanted there to be 
Billy's art in it. And then yeah. we would have been looking at, at bare minimum, 750 yeah. pages. <laughs> so that was and not... Tell me, tell me about the art, because obviously podcasts are notoriously visual. Um, it's... Uh, my brother is, a, is an artist. He's a year younger than I am. So we grew up in the exact... I have no memory of life without Billy. Mm. Not my very earliest memory, Billy's in. Mm. He's in a stroller. He's just an infant. But I, that's what I remember, my very first memory. And, um, and it just happened that he's a very visual person and I'm a very verbal person. And so we always had these projects, mm. always these little cards for our grandparents where I'd write a little poem and he would draw a picture. Yeah. Right up through grad school, we were doing these things. Yeah. So when I started working on the essays that became Late Migrations, and, and my friends and my writers group kept saying, this is going to be a book. You know that you're writing a book. And I hadn't given any thought to that, having never written a book. You know, this was a new, new a surprising <laughs> development in my 50s. Because I didn't realize you were like 57 when you wrote your first. Well, when it came out. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. So, yeah. And That's an amazing, I mean, for, for people who are never quite sure where life is going to take them, I find that so just beautiful. It's very encouraging to people my age and not at all encouraging to young writers. <laughs> like, they don't want to give like, any could take pot forever. thought to the possibility that they might be in their 50s before this <laughs> dream comes true of theirs. But But when I started working on those essays that were you know, that began in as meditations for myself after my mom died. Yeah. And then I did start thinking about how to put them together. The very first thing before I even figured out a, a structure for the book was, well, there has to be room for Billy's art because Billy's feeling all these same feelings too and oh. remembering all these same yeah. things. So Yeah. So it's woven together. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. I want to uh, bug you about the word devotional for a second because there is, I mean, when you're describing the natural world, another way we would put it is like you're you're cherishing natural revelation. Right? You're looking at the specificity, which gives us a feeling of the order of things, which makes us feel the sacredness of things in a really intense way. There's that lovely quote by... Um, by Alice Walker, who writes, I think it pisses God off if you walk by the color purple in a field somewhere and don't notice it, which I always think of um, in The Simpsons. There was the the uh, Reverend Lovejoy, who was always mad if people weren't getting married inside of churches and insisted that everyone getting married outside was getting <laughs> married in the cheap showiness of nature. The cheap showiness. <laughs> Which, like, I, every time something stuns me, like when Al House Walker's comment about the color purple, is I'm just like, ah, the cheap showiness of nature. Well, it is, in one sense, it's very true. Nature is quite a show off. Yeah. It, 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 some of the things will just take your breath away. Yeah. Right now, if you have time while you're in town, see if you can go to Shelby Park. Um, there's a, an entire field with a path through it of Coreopsis in bloom, these bright yellow flowers covered with bees and butterflies. Mm. And you just look at that and you just think, good God. Yeah. How magnificent. The Grand Canyon's great, yeah. But look at this flower field of flowers yeah. and butterflies. Does that give you a feeling of the holy sometimes? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. It's, um, I think that's where God has always been for me. Yeah. It, I loved church too. I loved the stained glass and the light coming through the stained glass. Wow. And I loved the incense and I loved the candles and the, oh, and singing. Human voices raised in song make me cry every single time, it, especially a cappella singing. Yeah. But, um, but that is all human. Yeah. That's what we made thinking it would please God. What God made is, is totally different. Mm. Mm. It's a big pile of flowers in my way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Full of bugs. So and possibly a <laughs> copperhead. <laughs>